Get Puck. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Get Puck podcast. Matt Vito and Dave here with you. And um, we are inching much closer to the start of that season, but already there is some pretty significant news in Habs land. Let's get you caught up real fast, and then we're going to talk about it. Number one, let's just get it out of the way because the man deserves our respect. Paul Byron hanging up the skates after 12 seasons. He is retiring officially. Uh, Immediately after the announcement of his retirement, the Habs also mentioned that he will have a position um, with player development, which I think is phenomenal. I think the guy is a class act. Um, I think he gave everything he could possibly give to this organization while he was here for eight years. And I ask you just your thoughts about him and perhaps your favorite memory, um, which I'm pretty confident will probably be the same for all three of us. But anyways, let's see what's up. Vito, go ahead. This guy started off as a waiver claim and became a fan favorite immediately. Was able to capture the hearts of everyone and his most memorable moment has to be the Stanley Cup final goal. I mean, he... One of those, the guy who took that picture should get money every single time somebody uses it. That's one of those pictures that, in my opinion, is, is quite iconic. Just the way it's done, who it's against, what it meant as a goal. It's one of those, it's one of those pictures that you're always going to look and see. Like, if it was anybody else other than Paul Byron who was a superstar, it would be everywhere. Everyone would be talking about it. It's like with that Wayne Gretzky goal when he scored number 802. The team with Solani ripping the, you know, the... the the, the, the gl- putting it the up there some movie. big some big time only pictures the picture. and goals there, man. O- only the picture not okay. the talent okay. not these because he's nowhere close to those people and okay. those players but that the, the quality of that picture and the, the whole movement and all that is just i love it but everybody Paulie heard me. it here first gretzky solani <laughs> ah you Byron. guys you guys you know what i meant it's just it's just a very nice it was a very nice moment and there was a lot of meaning behind it it's one of the most memorable Habs goals in recent memory. And there's nothing more to say. The guy, the guy is, is just he was a good guy and a good team player. He got got the A on his on his jersey too. What more can you say? He's never been a problem in the room, as far as we know. Everybody's loved him. And now he gets hired and he's he was with the Habs brass. So why not? Yeah, I figured as much, Dave. Yeah, I mean the same, the same great moment. Obviously, it made what made the the moment epic too is like it was pandemic times, right? So like the arena was like black tarped off, and yeah. it was just like it's an eerie sense that you're never gonna see ever again, probably in in NHL Hopefully. history. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was just it was an incredible time, and and just I think anybody watching that game and watching that series and. It was just fantastic. Everything came together to make that moment. And uh, Bob Byron, just his speed, the way he skates, his speed is just something that you you have to admire. And, you know, he, he said it best in his, in his retirement post or whatever, that he went from going to be hockey to assistant captain of the Montreal Canadiens. I mean, that's pretty cool. So, I mean, I think everything's been said possibly about Paul Byron you could do. I think a lot. he took a lot of people by surprise, too. He spoke French, uh, you know, uh, when he came. Yep. I, I know a lot of the media wasn't expecting that. It's like, oh. Look at this. The guy speaks French, too. He was a perfect Montreal Canadian, so kudos to does him. He still go, does he still go down as the best waiver claim of all time for now? He's got to be up there, man. Yeah, sure. He's got to be up there to go from waiver claim to an eight-year stint with the team. I mean, obviously, he had those points where they put him on waivers later on there, but but he wasn't claimed. He stayed with yeah. the team eight years. Assistant captain, he wore the A. I mean, produce. Well, they, I, they put him yeah. on the waivers at, uh, more at the end when, when his injury was really well, yeah, starting yeah. to pile up. I mean, you know, and, he, and at that point, there was already rumors that, really that he was he was hurt. So yeah, but no, I, I'll I, say I, that that goal doesn't define his career. But it, it's like you, he was a hard worker and he really that, started that from the bottom. Was, was just yeah, fast. they were super fast. Everybody talked about Paul Byron and his speed. It was evident when he was out there. But that goal is the apex of his career. I mean, that should be in a gigantic custom painted version above the mantelpiece in the Byron residence. That was a phenomenal goal. I hope I hope it is. And if it isn't, I hope he gets in touch with somebody after hearing it on the Get Puck podcast and he should get that commissioned. So <laughs> thank you, Paul Byron, for your service. He's obviously going to stick around in the organization. But another thing that happened organizationally um, was a trade. There was a trade done uh last night um so we finally have the last domino i believe of the um of the jeff petrie second time around trade 
where Casey DeSmith finds his way over in Vancouver for Tanner Pearson and a third round pick in 2025. Um, off the cuff, I think most people, well, I don't know, most people. In fact, uh, from what I've been seeing, there's been quite a bit of like back and forth, whether this was, you know, another Kent Hughes masterclass or eh, don't we have enough forwards already? This guy isn't he super injury prone. What are we doing? Casey DeSmith could have maybe got something else, which hilarious. People think that, but whatever. Um, so let's break that down, shall we? Um, let's look at the player. I mean, we're not even going to look at Casey DeSmith realistically. He was a hab for 18 seconds. So they basically got Tanner Pearson in with a third. Now, I ask you this because I think this is another interesting point of this trade. And I'd like to get your opinions on it. Was it the third round pick that was what Kent Hughes went after? Or was it Tanner Pearson? What was what did he covet more in this particular trade for those two assets, Dave? Oh, I think it's got to be uh, the risk that taking a flyer on Tanner Pearson. I mean, uh, the third round picks. I mean, whatever, man. You could just stack up your third round picks all the time. It's not guaranteed to be. It's not a terrible. Uh, I mean, it's there's nothing wrong with stacking picks, but like people who say, "Oh, master class flipped it for a third or second round pick." Okay, I mean, I guess. Um, I think I think taking a flyer on Tanner Pearson. This guy's a first, uh, a former first overall pick. He's a guy who put up, you know, I think twenty four goals at his at his best. Obviously, he's had that hand injury, and he's and he's in that, you know, kind of. There's an investigation around how it was handled by the Vancouver Canucks and uh, the effect they'll have on his career long term. Who knows what's going to happen? But it's another project that Ken Hughes is obviously becoming famous for. Right, is a guy who collects these these types of projects and hopes that you know they 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 work out. And I don't see anything wrong with it. It cost them absolutely nothing. I think nobody had Casey DeSmith really as a part of this team going forward. So it basically cost them virtually nothing to take a fire on this guy other than maybe a roster spot for a younger guy and, and, and you know, um, trimming down the competition and the, the available spots. But other than that, I'm okay with it. I don't think it's a I'm, – I'm not blown away with it. I wouldn't call it a master class of anything. I think uh, it's a team taking a flyer, expending themselves with a, an extra goalie and uh, you're taking a flyer on a guy who has some potential but is bogged down by injuries, which is a familiar theme. Okay. I think it was so, more for the third. I think it was more for the third. Round okay. Pick. All right. All right. Interesting. Go. <laughs> Tell me I why. Think, I think it was more for the third round pick. Uh, when you look at the Munchal Canadians, they've got 13 picks um, in the next two years with their first four rounds. And I think they're just, you know, I, it looks like when you look at the trend and all the picks that they're acquiring, especially for 2025. I kind of see it as that's maybe the time when they look and they say, okay, this is where we're done trying to stockpile prospects and whatever is around that 2025 mark. And at the same time, the, the, the picks are assets that can be moved to go and acquire uh, more proven or more ready NHL players. But when you look at it, in, you can look at it in another angle too, is that the goalie market is, doesn't, is not very strong and it doesn't have a whole lot of value out there. So when you look at Casey DeSmith being moved for Tanner Pearson, who's a former first, uh, first round pick, and a third round pick that he actually got pretty good return. The only thing about Tanner Pearson is that he did get hurt. He has been hurt. Um, he did, you know, he's got a, he's got some, uh, he's got a veteran leadership behind him. He's got some, he's got some experience so he could help with the kids. And Christian Dvorak hurt, so they just didn't want to lose a vet when they're already thin on in terms of veterans. So they went and add one in the time being because they don't know when Christian Dvorak is going to come back. Especially well, they said, they said the, the Dvorak thing came out that it looks like earliest is going to be November. I think the point that you bring up, though, is something that's not really spoken about too much. Although Kent Hughes in his presser that was just uh, about a half an hour ago from the time of this recording did mention he comes with uh, two Stanley Cups and and kind of he kind of angled his his sort of acquisition of Tanner Pearson in that regard. We wanted more veterans on the team. It's a very young team. Um, a lot of people are upset now saying that, well, he's going to take the spot of a kid, a kid who might, might have deserved a shot up there. Tanner Pearson's going to play bottom six minutes. I think we all agree on that. Oh, it, it, it all depends, right? I, all well, depends. I don't see Tanner Pearson all of a sudden coming here with a risk that is, to, I think we also just read, is only at 80% now after all the rehabbing. And apparently this injury is very, very uh, hard to shake where it was specifically injured. Um, so... Will he will he be completely just a body? I don't know about that. If he can come back and be the guy that he was in 2019, which is doubtful, but if he could, then then this was great. You have him, expiring contract. He plays strong for the year. You flip him, you get more stuff. 
you probably maxed out a Casey DeSmith's potential return when you got Pearson in a third. I think most people that were expecting more for DeSmith are a little bit off the rocker. I mean, bear in mind that he was just kind of. I thought honestly, I thought trade. if you just if you just went with picks only, Casey the Smith, yeah. maybe a fifth and a seventh, something like yeah, that. Just to get him out of there, exactly. Get him out exactly. of there. That's that's but one. Pearson, I'm looking at more as a whole. I'm looking at the whole trade, everything. Montreal got a lot of assets to just be a third team in the mix. Okay, because I know we're looking at oh, Casey the Smith got traded, but we acquired Casey the Smith because we took on the Jeff Petrie uh, contract initially. So when you look at the whole thing, it's like Hoffman and Pitlick got out and netted Lindstrom, a 2025 second, Nathan Laguerre, a 2025 third, a 2025 conditional fourth round pick, and Tanner Pearson. I, That's how I, I think, see it. Yeah, trade-wise, asset-wise, I think everybody's got to give this double thumbs up. It was crazy what you were able to get for Rem Pitlick and Mike Hoffman, no doubt. But it doesn't change the fact that now that you got these guys, you got to look at what you got. Sure, the picks are nice. The picks are nice. It's collateral. You can trade. The, you always add these as little little sweeteners to other things to make another trade happen. But finally, you got to look at who you have. They got rid of Mike Hoffman and Rem Pitlick from, from their actual roster, and they replaced them with Tanner they Pearson. No, what they had no future for. But, they had but no now future you have – Hold on now a they second. Because now that you have – Hold on. A, and it's you have player. Tanner Pearson on the team now. Yeah. Now, could they put him on waivers? Absolutely. I don't suspect that they're going to. But you have him on the team. So now that you have him there, where does this where does he slot in? Is he gonna do anything to make the team better? Is this just a body as a stopgap? Is Kent Hughes hopeful that he's gonna be able to find a little bit of spark and then trade him like he wanted to do with perhaps Monaghan last year before he got hurt? Is maybe. that the game plan? Yeah, like, maybe. Was, exactly. So what, exactly. He's got a one year contract. It's exactly go for it, Dave. Go. Uh, you, you just you can't over. I think we are, we're over analyzing it a little bit, and I think I know that's what we do around here. But it's just like, look, he got he had an asset, a goaltender that wasn't going to play, and he traded him away, and he got an asset in return that is is expires at the end of the year. Maybe you could flip him at the trade deadline if all works out well, and if not, it doesn't hurt the team. There's there's no downfall to what 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 this move brings or anything other than if you really really wanted that fourth line or third like uh, that that winger spot and you thought he really is stealing something away a spot away from someone that deserves it more but i'm not of that belief so to me look it's a, it's a flyer the guy took a flyer it's a trade that you see a million times in the nhl sometimes it works out sometimes it doesn't it's it's a good move from ken hughes perspective and that's that i, I think that that's it and i think that you know, I, it's not a genius move by anything. It's not like chess while we, everyone's playing checkers. It's a move. It's a move, and he got he. But does it does it hurt him. the team? I think I the bigger know. question no. is a lot of people no. are asking that. Like you bring in this guy who is injury prone, who hasn't played a full season in three but, plus years. Okay, okay. Is he taking the another, spot of somebody who should have been there? If that's, he's injury, I'm asking the question. If he's injury asking. prone, if he, if he's so injury prone, and that's the one thing you knock you got on this guy. That spot's going to be filled by whoever deserved it, anyways. Is it not? It's going to be injured. And on top of that, if he is injury prone, that concern's gone. It's, it's going to go on LTIR till the end of the year, and he's off the he's off the books anyway. If he's if he gets hurt again, and when you think of it, who's he taking a, a spot away from? Yelonen, Pizetta. So what? So uh, what? So what? I, okay, so I, listen again. I'm not necessarily throwing my hat into one camp or another saying I, I agree that he's taking a spot or not. But fact remains that this guy is now an NHL contracted player who's on the team, who wasn't there a day ago when we all were doing our different projections on who should be in the top 12. And now he's there, which means somebody's got to drop. Somebody now isn't. Now you're right. Is Pizzetta the guy? Is Armia going to be traded or put well, on waivers? No, it's it's going to be Pizzetta. You know? to, let's assuming the Montreal because right now they have twenty three players. Okay, with the Vorak being on on LTIR. Okay, assuming that that's the case, you're looking at Pizzetta. That's probably the guy that goes down, or will rotate with with probably Armia if he's having a, a bad stretch or a bad start and, and whatever the case may be there. But it's like. I know some player, people are going to say, oh, yeah, but what about Joshua Rua? What about Owen Beck? Those guys have been proven that they can play in the NHL just yet. This doesn't mean they won't. And if they, if they if they get to Laval and they start performing and doing really well, they're going to find space. They're going to make space for them. Be it Somebody's going to get hurt because it always seems to be the case. Or they're going to make a move or put somebody in waiver, uh, down on waivers to, to open up a spot for one of those guys. But right now, today... You, we cannot walk into the to the season and say Josh Rutter was a lock for the third or fourth line. 
Owen Beck is a is a lock for a three C role. None of those guys are locks. They're they're a lock for Laval. Go in Laval, prove yourselves, do what you got to do, and make sure you try to get some like Tanner Pearson out of the the roster so that you can you can play. You know, Yolona is the only one that you can look and say he played in the NHL last year. He showed he had a deceptive shot. He showed some things that he belongs in the NHL to a certain degree. I don't know on a night to night basis, but he's the only one that's really getting hurt from Tanner Pearson being there. So is this perhaps then you, with thinking about it from the other way that that yes they brought in this vet to purposefully take up a spot to not have to bring a kid up who is you're suggesting not ready and to look out of and, and lose them. the confidence. So, so no, that's no perhaps the reason. Them. There's no reason to rush them, and at the same time, I see it also as you were losing a vet in Christian Dvorak. Okay, he happened to be somebody that you could you were like, okay, is he going to play three C this year? Is Sean Monahan going to play up? Now, Sean Monaghan, you could literally say he's your 3C. He's locking in. He's going to be your 3C to start the season. Put Tanner Pearson probably on his left because, like you said, he's going to be play on the bottom six role and just let it go. And if there's somebody coming out of camp who really stands out and is a forward and it, we, we had them cemented as a Laval Rocket uh, top six player or whatever the case may be there, then they'll make space for him. But right now, we cannot go into the camp or going into the season thinking that right away okay. Josh Lacroix is the guy to walk in. F I, I know you've been talking a lot, Josh Lacroix, but I do have this because I am doing projections of the lineup now that we have Tanner Pearson on the team. Dave, how do you feel about a third line that consists of Tanner Pearson, Sean Monaghan, and Brendan Gallagher? And is there something we can come up with about the injuries that have occurred to that line, and we can do got no the reality hands. of band games lost? <laughs> they got no hands. That whole line has no hands. Oh, my God. Goodness, yeah, that's a rough. Uh, if that's if that's the third line you're going with, I mean, that's uh, you're you're hoping and praying that, that everything works Woo! out. But hey, maybe that's the case. Look, I mean, it's just it's okay. Like I I I just think that like the people who deserve the spots are gonna find a way to earn them, and and that's that. You know, there, there's no one that's gonna be held back from this. Maybe somebody uh, they won't get the shot they would have got, that, but. Who cares? They'll, they'll get it eventually if they keep playing well in Laval, if they keep going. Like, I just think people overreact to these certain things. It's kind of, and, and I understand it because you kind of look at this roster and you're like, man, another forward? Like, what are they doing? And But at the end of the day, it That's is what it is. That's the knee-jerk reaction. Yeah, sure. exactly. And yeah. and I think that it, it's not 100% harmful. It's not, it's it just, it has a chance to work out in the favor and, and a chance come March or wherever the hell the trade deadline is. That you, we come back and say, oh, that was a good movie. I actually picked up an asset for him. Or, oh, okay, it didn't work out. Oh, well. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, it's another, it's a proof that this management team is willing to take flyers on guys. And and it's not a it's not a home run swing, but they're willing to try. You know, Sean Monaghan, Kirby Dog, uh, Newhook, whatever the case may be, they're taking chances on these guys, on these projects, and hoping they fit in with their system. They have the, they, they, and I don't think that there's any ha real harm done in it because the players who, are technically affected or whatnot, they'll they'll make they'll find their way to the have the roster. So, so the, the worst project, case sure. scenario is it's negligible in terms of affecting the team in a bad way, but mm -hmm. on the upside, it can actually be, be very beneficial by having veteran leadership, a proven winner, two-time Stanley Cup guy, older guy, and then maybe plays well and then can flip them later on. You put one very in there too much. It's beneficial. I wouldn't say it's very beneficial, but it's beneficial. <laughs> All right. Beneficial. Sure. Okay. So they, they basically got three projects. Four if you want to throw in new hook for some people. But you got Monaghan. You got Pearson. You got Lias Anderson. Don't forget that one. He's, he's there too that they basically got him. And and they got new hook that we're still there. There's question marks. So it seems like we're going into sure. every season with question marks and certain players. I, I think new hook's going to do great for Montreal. But yeah. you know, uh, but, but Anderson's not a lock for this for this roster, right? Like he, no, he, oh, but it's I, still I, a project. I, yeah, I guess in, in the future, I guess. Sure. Yeah, they're still taking a flyer on him. You know, there's some history there with with Jeff Gordon and Lance Anderson, and it's again, it's another former first round pick player. So, mm -hmm. to your point, yeah, they they like to take flyers on guys. I just there's like that third line; they're all held up by nuts and bolts. It's all metal. Go, uh, Gallagher's hands busted. Tanner Pearson's hands busted. Sean Monahan's hip is busted. It's all nuts and bolts keeping that line together. If in fact that's the line. Matt, uh, we don't hear you.
Yeah, we have uh, lost. Oh, sorry, guys. There you go. So, so at that point, then, so then, I guess, is it worthwhile to also discuss, like you were just mentioning there? So, and I think it's funny that you keep saying that Tanner Pearson. You're saying, oh, they got another first, uh, a former first round pick. I mean, that is many, many years removed. For when sure. you talk about a, when you talk about a new hook, or you talk about Kirby Doc, that's not that long ago. So, saying that they got a former first round, even Lias Anderson, you can still kind of play that game. I think Tanner Pearson at this stage. We're not going to really be like, oh, he got a former first round pick well, and a third. Come a first on. round pick Let's just means it just means that the potential was there at one point, right? There was a potential for more, and he never lived up to his potential. That to me is what a former first round pick means. Well, I mean, he was doing he was doing well for a while till he got hurt, right? I mean, uh, for a while, like you saw, he got uh, he was basically a forty point producer, twenty something goals. Yeah, and, I mean, you know, for a guy, who, for a guy who got drafted, uh, excuse me, uh, he was thirtieth overall. That's not yeah. bad for a guy who was drafted thirtieth overall. Basically, at that time when he was drafted, he was a last pick of the first round. He's only hit twenty goals twice, though. I mean, like I wouldn't say that he's like you know a, a can't. He was a can't miss prospect, but he was a first overall pick. So that that to me, that's all that means is that first round, first round, first round. What did I say? First, first overall. overall. Yeah, I don't know why I say that. Yeah, yeah, no, no. As a first, as a first overall, he'd be a bust. Not first overall, first round, obviously. Not, not Neil Yakupov bust, but a bust. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. So, I mean, now that we're looking at it, I guess the last question that is to be discussed is given the fact that they still, if you consider some of the younger guys as as better odds than not of being on the team, will there be more trades? Coming yes. before the start of the season, okay. Yes. Who and who and when? Well, who and when uh, isn't? I think there's gonna be more moves, obviously between waivers and whatever. But more trades. I can't tell you who's going to move out. I don't know because I didn't even expect the Tanner Pearson acquisition. You know, I expected the Casey the Smith trade and all that, but I didn't expect that to be the return. So from now until October 10th, I expect the Montreal Canadiens and Kent Hughes to make more moves. I just don't know who they're going to move. I would say a defenseman, probably. Um, I still think that they they got to find a way to move Chris Weidman for future considerations and things like that. They got to figure out what to do because they actually have, not only do they have too many forwards, but they've got too many defensemen as well. Yeah. I, it's just to me, I, I it doesn't often happen. Like the, teams that right now, I mean, they're full. They all have these massive rosters, training camp rosters, and they have, and, and barring injury, I mean, it's, it's going to be hard to move some of these guys. And it's not as if you're moving guys who are like, wow, we really need UL Army on our roster. Like there's going to be multiple teams calling you, right? Like it's going to be hard to swing a deal pending another team, you know, missing a huge piece because of an injury or, or, or something happening like that. I think it's going to be hard. I, I think defenseman is probably your best bet. Uh, you're right, Vito. I think that you, you you might be able to move, you know, like Chris Weidman. Like, what's Chris Weidman going to do this year? You know what I mean? Like, it's That's why I said for, fu for future considerations. I can Not tell you this. Time. The Edmonton Oilers right now just announced that Ekholm won't be there to start the season. See, so, so that's interesting. But then there might, must have other options, you know. Like, is that do you? Have, oh, I there's, mean, there's the, yeah. Like they're not rushing to Chris. They're not calling no, the They're like, not. They're not. We they're need not Chris rushing. Weidman. What is it going to take? No. They're not rushing, but uh, a lot of teams at that point don't want to pay too much for a player, and typically yes, they'll true. move everybody up, and they'll just say, okay, who can I have to have a body in the meantime until my player could come back yeah, in about a month sure. from now? So that's, somebody that's, like Chris Weidman can be a stop gap on a. You know, as your sixth, seventh defenseman, while everybody else moves up, just so that they don't lose ground. It's the NHL. The NHL has changed in, in a way where the the first few games of the season, while people just tend to scoff at it and be like, "It's nothing." Those are some points that, at the end of the day, you want to accumulate as much as you possibly can because teams go through cold stretches, as we all know, and those points at the beginning are crucial. I, if I, I can't remember which season it was, but Montreal basically started off strong, like they typically do faded away, came back strong again, and faded away in the end, but just squeezed into the playoffs. Like, we've seen that before. And there's mm -hmm. and everybody now talks about, we just need to get it, get into the playoffs and then see what happens. So there's so many teams and, and old-school general managers that believe in that, that they may take a flyer on somebody like a Chris Weidman, or maybe they'll pony up more for something else just to not lose ground right off the bat. It's so tight, the league, that and every point matters. I think I think that's perfectly said. I mean, ultimately, it's you got you got to like 
realistically, the way it works is, and I think this made the most sense when they were talking about the whole Smith thing, like the goalie market, you got to wait a little bit as you get closer to the start of the season because people get hurt and then you got to find someone to trade. So that's kind of sort of the same sentiment I feel about other guys. There are certain contract players, like we would all love at this point, I think, all due respect to him, of course, there, but Yol Armia, if somebody somewhere could take this guy off the Canadians' hands for literally anything except an NHL contract back, that would be crazy good. Like, that would be a little bit of... Well, that would know, be a success. That would, We've said it that would be a monster if, success. If somehow he was able to move uh, your Armia and not retain salary, you literally could just put that Kent Hughes had the most successful offseason to date. It just is by moving that contract. One of the most... Bit unlikeliest things I've ever heard in my yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not, not happening. happening. It's not, happen it's not that, happening. That contract was a was a bad contract to give out back then by the version of it. Yeah. It's, it's, and you know what's I understand why guy? he did it at that moment, yeah. in that day, but it was, it was, it was one of those that like, he just, wow, you, like when he was doing when he was playing for for uh, the national team there in in whatever it was, the World Cup, was it the World Cup or the Olympics? I don't even remember when he had that monster like like everybody was like, oh my god, this guy's tearing it up when he really it was wants the world to championship. Yeah, it was I the think. world championships. That was it. So like, if we could see that, yeah, but you it, know what I mean. We've that seen would it before. Be like, oh, that'd be great. Yeah, but but it's a small sample. Well, that that's the that's there you go. And then that's the issue, right? We see it in small sample size. So his game yeah. le- le- lends to a, a world championship run where he plays, you know, amazing out of the spotlight for a few games. You know, Yoel Armia was it. two goals here, two goals there inconsistent and it's uh, and it's too bad it's too bad i mean obviously i think the contract i think any way shape or form you look back on it uh it it was a bad contract clearly mm -hmm. but i mean if he can just be a little bit more consistent it wouldn't be such a glaring um you know issue that we see on the fourth line and and it's just you know he would be perfect obviously it'd be the hardest one to get rid of but i gotta think also even though with the Dvorak news that came out today that he's going to start on IR, and so that changes a little bit of the complexities of the cap management, which we were reading about the other day, which more or less stated that just by sheer virtue of Price's uh, contract going on uh, on LTIR and how the, the, the sort of cap is today, Kent Hughes would be forced to do more moves to, to, to make the cap sort of make sense and be, and be under the allotted number that he was supposed to be at. That has since changed with the news of Dvorak. So now there's not such a pressing uh, issue to trade people. Um, that there said, was though, no, I still think... There was think... no issue to begin with. Well, there was. There was. No... There was. Not really. They were there already was. talking about even what uh, putting price on uh, in-season LTIR was still possible even before the Dvorak. Uh, the Dvorak it was years. a lot more challenging than it is now with the Dvorak's four and a half going on now. Which, like, like... For people that are way smarter than me when it comes to this stuff, and I've been I've been diving deep into all the 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 tweets that they've been posting about that, the very notion that that um, the Vorax contract is now on LTR has has really like loosened the collar of Ken Hughes a bit. He would have been forced to do he would have been forced to do something to make it all compliant. Otherwise, throw a bunch of people on waivers that he might not have wanted to. Now he has the luxury of not having to do that. Although he still should do it. Well, he's still he's still well, he's still gonna have to it, to a certain degree. It all depends how many roster players he's planning to keep because he has to maintain the twenty three man roster uh, compliant compliancy there. He has to be compliant. So he can't keep everybody. And right now, as it stands, with all the players that we have predicted and, and are projecting to to be there on opening night, he's already at twenty three players, and that's with Primo being sent through waivers. Which I think, you know, is clear that he's going to be. Because otherwise, who is it? Do you think Do you think Primo out of camp rocks the world and now all of a sudden we have a, a goalie uh, situation where... I could tell you this about Primo is that if he does rock the world, as you say, and he, play, he performs well in camp, it won't be long before he has one of those games where you're just like, this guy's not NHL already. Yeah, but how long how long is that going to happen for? I mean, we're we're kind of timing out here where we wanted to end the episode, but not to go too deep. But how much longer do you give not Caden Primo? You don't give him. I know goalies take longer to develop, but he hasn't shown that he can be the guy or even an an NHL guy on an every night basis. 
I don't know if Dave agrees to that. I know I, I know Dave has 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 said his uh, comments about Primo in the past, but we want to know. I, Dave. Yeah, I don't I don't see him as as the future of the Montreal Canadiens uh, in terms of of goaltender of the future. Could that change? Maybe, but I just haven't seen enough of him to uh, to say that it has. In my opinion of him, watching him, to talking to people around the team, to talking to people who, you know, in the know, I just don't think he's the guy. Goalies do take longer to develop. That's absolutely true. The, the best example of that is like Ryan Miller, right? Who was like forgotten for a long time and then he came back and, and you know, he, he developed, I think, at 26 or something, right? When Ryan Miller started going on his, on his. So I think like definitely they take time, but at the end of the day, I think you have to kind of see something there. And to me, I just don't think that, that that's it. I mean, could he have an excellent season here or there? Yes, but I don't think he's the future of the Canadians. And I don't think he'll have an epic, uh, every time he's, he's been called up, it hasn't really worked out. He hasn't no, I mean, I'll, let's also give him a little bit of yes. leniency to the times that he were called up. I mean, no, you know, not, but the, yes. not the best yes. situations, not the called. best situation. So, so that aside, the last little thing, because I did want to mention is there are 72 players coming to camp. How nice. do you boys feel about that? Um, whatever, bring them all. It's, 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 it is whatever, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> people are making a big deal about this. Who cares? Let it be 172. Who exactly. Cares? You, you, yeah, you, you pretty much know how it's going to be, you know, shrunk down to. We know the guys who are going to be there at the end. Why not? To see if there's happens to be somebody that blows everybody away and, and that, that was would have been under the radar. Bring them all and, and, and cut them all as you see. There, there's always one, and, and you know what? I think like William Trudeau is going to end up. Surprising quite a few people. This but guy always... is William Trudeau. Did he marry into your family? Like, what's, ding, what's ding, up with ding, William ding. Always. He's the leader of the fan club. <laughs> Send all of your fan mail to Vito. He'll make sure that William gets it. Holy I God. was also going to say Mill Heineman, but uh, we'll see what happens there. But to, to Dave's point, that's 72 players. Yeah, like, who cares? We, we could pretty much guarantee that 21 of them are not going anywhere. They've made the team. That's Heck, cool. even 22 have made the team. There's like one spot, really. When you think of it, there's one spot. You know, it's, um, listen, it's just funny to see that people are starved for hockey content and for the start of the season. It's just fun to see everybody up in arms, either defending like tooth and nail or just being so upset about some of the more sillier aspects of the just on the cusp of the season starting. So, Needless to say, 72 players come to camp. Everybody pump the brakes. It doesn't matter. It's going to get weeded out very quickly. Um, and then, you know, who knows? Maybe like Dave was saying, there's somebody who just shines super bright and was unexpected. And if you only brought, if you only invited, uh, you know, 32 people, he might have not have been there and then you would have never known. So let them all come. Let them all get cut, as Dave said, and we'll see what happens there. <laughs> what, I, what, I do, what, I, what I do want to pose is a question. For, for our little question to take away, which we'd love to see you guys write in the comments if you can. Give us your take about the Tanner Pearson sort of acquisition. Um, what do you think about it? Is it what we were sort of suggesting that like on the low end, it's negligible, it can't really hurt, but on the high end, this could be just another really good thing to happen for the team where he'll get unloaded for something else in the future. So it's just the gift that keeps on giving. Um, tell us what you feel about that. Give us maybe your projected lineups too. Do you do you see the uh, man? We got to come up with a good name for that third line. Do you see the line of uh, of Pearson, uh, Monahan, and um, and Gallagher being something that can actually line. happen? It's the nuts and bolts line. Nuts and bolts line. <laughs> well, not bad, not bad. So let us know. Let us know in the comments, be it on uh, on the video here or on uh, X or wherever you like to post. Um, and of course, we always throw it in at the end. If you haven't already, please consider like, subscribing, all that kind of stuff. We appreciate it. Um, and thank you for taking the time if you made it all the way to the end here at 34 minutes in. So without further ado, I think that brings us to a close, gentlemen. Thanks for taking the time. Everybody, thanks for listening. And for Vito and Dave, I'm Matt, and this was Get Pucked.